Hey everyone, and welcome to another Commercial Integrator uh, webinar. Uh, today, we have a very special uh, kind of new thing that we're doing, casual conversation with MVIX, BrightSign, and Snap Install. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, as you can see, uh, today we have Mike Killian uh, of MVIX Digital Signage. Mike, thank you for joining us today. Uh, Frank Pisano of BrightSign. Frank, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, it's a pleasure. And we've got Tony Green of Snap Install. Tony, thanks for joining us. Yeah, excited to be here. Yeah, we're excited to get to it. Uh, before we get started, though, uh, just a little bit of housekeeping for our audience. The audio portion of this webinar is broad broadcast over the internet, uh, so please do uh, make sure that your device uh, or computer's audio is available, unmuted, and the volume is turned up to an acceptable level. If you are having trouble with receiving the audio, please select the question mark icon in the upper corner of the webinar interface and select Test My System Now. This will give you information on your connection and how to remedy any problems you may have. Often just simply disconnecting and rejoining the event will allow you to catch a better stream of the audio if you are experiencing any audio problems. I also want to let everyone know there will be a Q&A session uh, after the presentation uh, part of uh, today's webinar. It's easy to submit your questions for our presenters during the event. On the left side of your screen, uh, you'll see a box labeled Ask a Question, where you can enter your questions. Questions that are related to the webinar topic will be held and answered during the Q&A session at the end of the event. However, questions related to technical issues can also be entered in the same box, and they'll be answered immediately by our webinar producers. Uh, I want to encourage everyone to ask questions throughout the webinar. No need to wait until the Q&A session. It'll be first come, first serve, um, so make sure you're asking questions as they come up. And uh, to get to the casual conversation, you know, for the most part, I know that you guys are going to be talking about a number of different topics. Uh, I'm going to fade into the background just a little bit. But to start us off, obviously, COVID-19 is, is top of mind for much of the country right now, much of the AV community. Um, how has COVID affected the digital signage industry? And how does the digital signage industry fit into uh, organizations heading back into the office? Hey, Jonathan, this is Mike. Thanks, uh, by the way, for kicking this off for us. We appreciate it. So I think this is obviously the, the most top of mind topic for everyone in the in the space right now. And um, it's hit different industries in different ways, and it's hit different sides of the digital signage provider space different ways, which is kind of what we're here to talk about today. Um, you know, speaking from the software side of the industry, I, I think one of the biggest changes has been surrounding the type of content that's effective now. Um, there's a wide variety of content, which was um, prior to February and March of this year, it would gained a lot of traction in education, gained a lot of traction in healthcare, food service and retail. And, you know, now maybe not so much. So from a content strategy perspective and a content delivery perspective, that's really what's on the top of our mind right now at MVIX is how do we um, stay relevant for our clients? How do our clients keep messaging relevant, keep getting people's attention right now? Um, and make sure too that we're not um, looping stale content. Uh, everyone at this point, I think, has a pretty good idea of what you know COVID tips are and, and how to stay safe. So we move beyond that, and, and it's more about um, staying in front of your audience and, and keeping it relevant for them. Yeah, Mike, those are great points. And you know, on the, the installation side, we are the you know boots on the ground mentality type company. So. We took a little bit of a different of a stance with our leadership team where we we did have to really think about the people and the, the processes and the procedures around it so you know we took we took some some information that was given to us and created a, actually a live document on our website uh, where it does track the different types of covid uh, responses and responsibilities for those people out in the field um, even down to a county level so it really it really became about that peace of mind protecting the people right our employees our customers our end users, our technicians, right? That's our product. So, you know, really that changed a lot of things where our guys now have to think about what are they touching? How do they clean or protect those surfaces? How do they how do they really make sure that when they leave that site that they're not, you know, endangering themselves, their family, or, you know, the customers that they're interacting with? Yeah, Tony, I, I, would, I would say that, you know, there's obviously challenging times with COVID and I'll try to focus on the positive portions of it, right? So. <laughs> The positive portions of it are the fact that we get to interact a little bit more with each other too. You've got the outreach of folks that we're not traveling. You know, I know that myself and I know you two as well, we're on planes a lot. And, you know, because we have that extra time, I've been making sure that we reach, reach out to our partners. 
I think uh, the one thing that's super valuable in the digital signage world is that ecosystem and those partnerships, right? So um, it gives us more time. I mean, I know the two of us have had a few happy hours and shared a drink together at, at some of these times, and, and just, you know, which is good to catch up, see how the business is going, where there's opportunities, you know, and it gives us a, a chance to do that. Now, on, on the bright side side, especially for, for me, it runs a sales team, it's a, it allowed us to have more time to enhance processes too, right? So fix some things that I wouldn't have had time to do if I was on a plane constantly or attending all these meetings. So uh, I think refining some of that stuff is going to go a long way and then hopefully puts us in a, a great position coming out of this to be a little bit more efficient. I think what, one thing we will see is we probably don't need to do as much travel. We're, we're finding some success without doing it, but boy, do I miss it. <laughs> Yeah, no, I totally hear you on that, Frank. I mean, I can't tell you the last time I was at uh, one of our mixers or, or, you know, even even presentations. I miss some of the ongoing in-person education that we that we get in our industry. But, you know, touching on the channel for just a second since you brought it up, I, I feel like um, a lot of channel partners out there are not necessarily getting the credit that they deserve right now. They're doing a great job weathering the storm. They're doing a great job getting on site. They're doing a great job continuing to talk to customers and, and try and find customer needs. And, you know, I hope that... Um, clients at least see um, how hard some of the, the integrators out there have worked during these past couple months to keep things fluid and keep things going, including truck rolls when sites are closed, you know, and things like that. So it's, I think that's off to the channel is what I would say. Yeah, and you know, a couple of you guys brought up some good points with the travel and, and the reconnection, right? We, we all deal with technology, so. I think that was a big key to to the success, right? This is a small ecosystem. I know we love using that word and it's a common word used, but we're all, you know, it's a very incestuous industry where we all know each other. We got to work together. We got to really understand, you know, what is everyone doing out there and, and staying connected. And, you know, like we mentioned, the happy hours and the virtual chats and, you know, we even got the virtual trade shows going on where we can still get that technology, get that information. Uh, but really reconnect. I've actually reconnected with a lot of people that maybe I haven't had the opportunity to get in front of or, you know, different things like that. So, Frank, you nailed it on the head with that. And, yeah, channel partners and processes is huge. It's, you know, we always said quarter one, we were we were running around with our heads cut off there for a while. It was a very, very busy quarter one, everything looking up, and then, you know, really something that none of us could prepare for with COVID-19 hit and things shut down immediately. But um, it was, in that sense, a blessing in disguise. We were able to really sit back and say, what do we need to do to be successful when we get past this, right? And and probably more importantly, how do we get past it together? I think that's a really key thing to think about is that ecosystem really did come together from the channel to manufacturing to services to content. It, it really came together and said, how do we adapt? How do we change? And, and what does that new new market or new industry look like? So, Tony, kind of touching on that for a second, you know, I think it's safe to say, I think, Frank, you'd agree that, um, you know, prior to February or March, we all had a pretty good idea of how the consultation process should work and how the design process should work for these types of projects. Um, what do you guys think about when now is the right time to bring up install and bring up um, who's going to be hanging these displays and who's going to be on site? Because that is kind of a sensitive topic for a lot of industries and a lot of clients right now. Yeah, I can take that one since I, I love to be involved with that. Um, unfortunately, I think a lot of times we, you know, in the past, we were kind of that, that last piece of the puzzle to, to put in reference and pun intended with our logo. But, you know, we, we really looked at it where people thought about what does that experience look like? What are what is our ROI or what do we want to obtain out of this this installation? Um, and then it really came to well, people were on site. They were able to get pictures, photos. Um, I think now it's really more important than ever to get us out and involved first. Right. We can get our team out there to go look at the site. We can make sure what that customer's idea or design was with their experience can actually be done now, right? So, and like anything else, I think it's good to bring us in sooner rather than later. Um, that way we can help kind of bring that together and, and we can have that ability to get those eyes. Or if it's new construction, we can get more more of a grasp on what does that schedule look like, right? Everything is slowed up with, you know, from even procuring equipment and, you know, getting raw materials. I mean, a lot of that stuff has been delayed and no one really knows what that timeline is, much like COVID. We just, we don't know. We don't have a crystal ball, so we don't know. Frank, what are you what are you hearing on the channel side in that space? I mean, uh, for the, the integrators who are going on site to kind of design and spec some of these projects, are, are they, what, what do you think the, the next couple of months looks like for them in terms of, you know, being led on site at, at various customer locations? 
Well, I definitely think it depends. Um, that, that's the easy political answer because it depends on the industry. It depends on uh, the need and what it's what the use of the digital signage is for. If it's reopening some of these businesses, they are they need to reopen safely. They need to you know they they got to get messaging to the, to the folks that are going to be coming in. Um, so obviously that becomes very important and they become that, you know, that, that needed piece of the puzzle. Um, so that becomes part of it. We also see the large projects where, you know, the, the capital might not be there yet um, and, and it gets delayed. You know, they're trying to save employees' jobs. So um, some, of, some of the signage that they're looking at may be pushed out, um, it, you know, and, and depending on what that market is or that industry, it could get pushed out to the right. Um, the beautiful thing, though, I've seen, um, at least on some of the bright sign projects, is very, very few things have been canceled. Um, we've had a few things move, and, and, um, and, but we haven't had anything canceled. And I think what happens when they move is they do get better communication. They get maybe Tony's organization involved uh, sooner than they would have. Um, and, you know, and some of that side is that they, it gives us all hope, too, to say, hey, these things are going to come back. We know we're going to have funding. We know it's super important to our business. It's just, you know, we're going to have to delay it a little bit. We get, we get that as well. Yeah, yeah we saw guys, it, yeah. Like, pause but not cancel, like you mentioned, Frank. We've had a lot of that. But a lot of maintaining, too, right? They want to make sure what they do have does work. So we've been actually seeing an increase in service calls over COVID. Uh, whereas maybe projects slowed up a little bit or rescheduled or, you know, a lot of what we hear a lot nowadays is I don't know yet. Um, but it's, yeah, it seems to be a lot of, a lot of movement still. And, and how do we safely open those doors is definitely key things right now. Well, for the projects that we've been working on at MVIX during this time, I mean, what we've seen too is that, that pause that you're describing, Frank, that's giving clients a, a real kind of opportunity to, to take a second glance at what content is going to drive return on investment with this. And for us as a CMS vendor, especially a, a vendor that's focused on content and, and options for our clients with content, um, that's huge because having that kind of front and center and giving people the, the time that they need to really understand what content's gonna drive success here with these and, and more importantly, who's gonna help get behind the wheel in the organization for that, that's been great for us. Um, and, and it's kind of an unintended you know, side effect and obviously we, we want everyone to be, you know, um, moving as quickly as they want to on these projects but a lot of times it's it's you know quick it's it's fast-paced installs it's fast-paced consultation process and so really putting an emphasis on um what's going to drive success is i think been a unintended side effect that uh so, some of that's going to be uh, reaped down the road in, in q1 q2 and these deployments are, are really up and, and running at full steam ahead so Guys, uh, a lot of people, when they think digital signage, they're thinking of travel or they're thinking of retail spaces. And those two are probably going to be the most affected by COVID for the longest term. What markets are you guys seeing? We've talked a lot about different industries and depending on the business. But specifically, where are the markets where there are opportunities now? And where are the markets that there are going to be opportunities as a vaccine comes out and then moving forward? Um, you know, once COVID is behind us. So where should integrators be keying in on and which customers should they really be pushing digital signage to? Well, I'll oh, try to no. because no. I always want to make sure folks aren't too concerned about a whole in, a whole vertical being um, in danger, right? So you mentioned retail. I'm, I'm pretty sure that the Home Depots and the Walmarts and the Targets of the world are doing pretty well right now. People are staying home. They're they need to work on their homes, and or you know, they're, 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 maybe they haven't been home this much, and they're like, "Damn, I'm gonna I'm gonna replace that leaky faucet." Um, so some of the retailers that we're finding retails a very very large vertical for for bright time, but some of the the verticals I, I would be cautious to take the full scale of this vertical is going to be down because um, there are going to be winners and losers in this COVID world. Uh, unfortunately, some retailers are excelling through this because um, you know their, their products are, are more needed now. Um, so I think that does that does happen. So I, I caution integrators to not take too broad of a brush. Um, the one thing that we've, I've had multiple discussions and, and some of the folks are going after the winners in the retail segment or uh, other winners during COVID or the, the organizations that are excelling. Um, the only thing to, to be cautiously optimistic about is your competitors are also going after those same winners, right? 
because there's not as much of them. So the, the list has become more targeted. So that's just one thing I noticed and want to make sure I mentioned. Yeah, from, from the, the MVIC side of the table, there's actually two industries that we've really seen significant uptake in the, in the uptake in the last couple of weeks here. Um, one is healthcare, and I'll put a big asterisk on that, which is assuming people have the time right now in healthcare to, to actually have a conversation about this, right? Um, but the, the, the funding is there in a lot of ways. There's a lot of, of money for obvious reasons being you know, poured into the healthcare space. And I think communicating with patients and communicating with staff in a time like this in healthcare, I mean, our technology should be at the forefront of those discussions. Digital signage is a fantastic visual communications tool um, and it excels in a lot of ways in emergencies and in this type of environment. So, you know, that's part of it. The, the second aspect, surprisingly, and, and a couple months ago, I wouldn't have thought that this was going to be the case, but we've seen a, a significant uptick in interest in franchise-based um, restaurant applications. And the, the key word there being franchise-based because that process from um, signing on as a potential franchisee with a brand to actually groundbreaking and opening your store and getting everything up and running is a lot of times is well beyond six months it exceeds a year right so people are looking ahead and saying hey you know late on in 2021 maybe 2022 i want to be up and running um, markets should be relatively stable by then so you know, why don't i put some dollars behind it now and let's get all the the busy work out of the way so we can get rocking and rolling when, when things are back to normal. And demand's gonna be there too. People are, for the most part, I think, tired of being at home and not having options for what they can do on a Saturday night. So um, that's exciting and we're, we're really looking forward to seeing that market take off. When yeah, on our side, side. Go ahead. Go ahead. No. no, go ahead, please. Oh, I was just gonna say, so yeah, kind of on our end, you guys nailed you know, a couple of those on the head. Even with QSR, a lot of people are looking at uh, specific to that technology, they're looking at a lot of the outdoor applications, right? A lot of people are coming and going, not spending time in the restaurant, but they still need to have that communication, drive through menu boards, things like that. Um, even in, in light of, you know, a lot of our audience being integrators, you know, we have seen a rise in the, the home applications of offices, right? How do they utilize that technology in homes as, you know, businesses do start to shut their doors, but realize they don't need to pay, you know, pay for that retail space or that, that office space. And now they're transitioning that to home offices or even looking at the collaboration or conference rooms, um, you, know, you know, even education, right? People are starting to go back to school and it's not just about the, the smart boards or the, um, you know, whiteboards or interactive boards. It's also about, you know, using this technology for, for traffic counting and weight counting when you look at retail and smart stores. Uh, so we are seeing a lot of the, the same technology, but the use case is a little bit different. I know Dave Haynes posted an article not too long ago, uh, in regards to using digital signage and software to, to kind of put together a, a waste system or traffic county and, you know, kind of integrating that with, you know, what we call the thermal scanners, right? That's a, a gold rush going on now that I'm sure we've all heard a million times, but um, it's, it is technologies that's there that, that can be utilized alongside of, you know, digital signage and, and that type of technology, how you can really integrate that together. Uh, when you guys are approaching customers uh, to kind of discuss bringing in digital signage, especially at this time, should the focus be more on the long tail benefit after COVID, everything that you can do with the system that we're putting in place now? Or are you guys really pushing the COVID benefits of delivering safety and health messages and, and the thermal uh, scanning and things like that? And then kind of the B story is what the system will do once COVID is behind us. Well, for me, I'll jump in on that, Jonathan. So for me, as a, as a outcome driven vendor in this, meaning we put a lot of emphasis on the long term to begin with anyway in these types of strategies and these types of deployments. Um, I get that question all the time in the last six months. And, and for us, I hate to sit on the fence, but for us, it's definitely a balance of both because there are absolutely real short term benefits that are going to be achieved with this technology if you're doing it correctly, right, if you're focusing on the right messaging. Um, but there's also a lot of long term ROI that if your brand or your organization has the capital to put behind it right now, you're going to reap benefits from digital signage six months, nine months, 12 months from now, where your competitors might not have invested in it at this point in time. Um, so for a lot of our clients, especially on the enterprise side, we're having these discussions where it's, hey, here's what we can do for you now. But let's keep this discussion going about where you're going to be, you know, sitting pretty nine months, 12 months from now and, and some of your competition more. So I think it's a little bit of both, um, not to give you a, a, no, a it, it's definitely both, Mike. I, yeah. I couldn't agree more. You know, we obviously have a big channel mentality, right? So 
we want our, our integrators to use bright sign hardware as their standard. So that's a long-term play. We want to be their, their platform. So that doesn't necessarily address the immediate, but man, is there an immediate need right now? You know, whether it's museums or retail shops or corporate communications or any of that stuff, there is an immediate need right now uh, for things, you know, maybe they had touch interactivity. They don't want it to be touch anymore. They want it, um, you know, there, there's something else that they want to do to avoid physical contact. That's an immediate need. But over the course of what we're trying to do the, as a channel friendly manufacturer, we're looking at them. And then if they run into short by all means, we have a product line and we will work with our partner ecosystem and get it what they need immediately. It's not that that they have right now. But you know, for the most part, what we're trying to talk about is hey, this is going to end at some point in the not too distant future. These are the different things you can do with signage that have nothing to do with the impact. Well, you know, one of the things touching on that, Frank, that's been on our minds, and I know it's been on the Bright Sign team's mind as well, is innovation. And for us here at MVIX, I mean, it's it's constantly about innovation. How can we um, deliver new positive success stories, positive outcomes, integrations, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, I know you, for instance, at Brightson, you just launched the audio player recently, which is pretty exciting. Um, for us, we've seen this time period um, foster a, a ton of different integrations and applications that we now support. And I think that is where we should be looking at as an industry, as a kind of bigger, um, bigger, broader umbrella surrounding this topic and this question of where are we going, is uh, the way that people communicate Right, the way that people um, achieve uh, certain audience outcomes or even measure certain audience metrics. You mentioned earlier people counting, for instance. Um, that's all going to change more in the future. What we're seeing now in you know, October of 2020 is not the end or the extent of the change that 2020 has brought to how people communicate. So um, looking ahead, the innovation isn't done. This was a kind of warm-up round from our perspective, and, and now it's time to get back in the ring. So. It has made it a little harder, uh, more challenging to do product launches. You mentioned our, our audio only player. Like it, it's a little bit more challenging because generally a manufacturer wants to do that around a big event, whether it's ISE, uh, Infocom, the, the late DSE or, or something along those lines. You, you generally try to keep your product launches for around some of those big events. Well, the big events aren't here right now. So um, we gotta, you got to get strategic. you got to... You have solutions and products specifically that will touch on this new world that we're living in. And then, you know what? Manufacturers got to keep innovating and they got to keep coming out with solutions. So just got to find unique ways to, to get those products out of the market. And I think on top of the innovation, it's the adapting too, right? I mean, you see a lot of companies doing something now that, you know, maybe they weren't doing six or eight months ago. and we've all got to adapt to those times as well, right? It's got to have that dual purpose or, you know, customer asks you for a unique request, like, you know, maybe we're looking at real film installs or plexiglass installs, right? These are still a part of the COVID, but as you look at technology, what else can we do with that, right? The thermal scanners are, you know, I do this Wednesday night happy hour that I've been doing with some industry folks and been doing it for, boy, 12, I think we figured it out. It's about eight months now. We've been doing it every Wednesday. We decided now we're going to take a step back and do it twice a month. Uh, but we talked a lot about the thermal scanners, and, and one of the things we talked about is got to have that dual purpose, right? It can't just be thermal scanning because you're right. We don't know how long this will last, and is that technology now going to be utilized in six months? Is that going to be a normal? We don't know. Um, but a lot of the times, what else can you use that that platform for, and what else can that be to protect us from other things down the road or utilize it for communication? So I think the big thing now is we've, we've got to adapt and, and everyone's got to adapt and that's really the only way to survive and we got to do it together, so. Yeah, no, that's a great point you bring up, Tony. And we're talking in this context about um, product development or service development, but at, this, at the end of the day, it's basically how can we better serve our clients, right? We're all in the same ecosystem here. Um, for us as a, a CMS vendor, um, that's been in some, some creative ways too the last couple of months, uh, things like billing. Right? I mean, a contract is a contract, but not necessarily. If we can help out a client, if we can maybe give them a little extra wiggle room, which helps them get by operationally for a few months, great. That's a win. That's going to boost their you know, overall success as a business. And you know, obviously for us, that's uh, going to lead to positive outcomes in the long run as well. So uh, I would look at the integrators too, and I would suggest that uh, maybe innovation in selling methodologies is something we, we should be talking about. 
Um, a lot of great conferencing technologies out there. Let's use that to sell to customers if they're not letting us on site and have those discussions and, and consult. So um, I think it's it's a pretty wide open door when you start down the creative path of how can we create better positive outcomes here. There's, there's tons and tons of ways that, that we can, and it's it's going to be pretty exciting in 2021, to say the least. Yeah, I'm just just quickly, you know, in, in the, we know that digital signage is going to be, you know, it, it's the VIXA study, Sean Wargo and all those guys at VIXA. Digital signage is the fastest growing segment. You know, it's one of the fast, one of the top two fastest growing segments, I think, in the VIXA community. Um, it's why we're excited as, I, you know, I, I sit on Digital Signage Federation's board, and I know Tony's so, real super active at MVIX's as well, and Digital Signage Federation. Um, it's why this relationship that we just launched with Avix is super important, but it also gives our integrators time right now when they're not, well, you know, hair on fire uh, to learn a little bit more about science, learn a little bit more about the ecosystem, and how to do a digital needs assessment for your customer on their digital signage, uh, the, uh, what they what they need for digital signage. You know, because a lot of our AV integrators are already. Uh, extremely deep into signage, and then there's some that are still just barely scratching the surface. So this gives them the chance to say, all right, Avixa trends are telling me this, that digital signage is growing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get my toe in the water and try to figure out a little bit more about it. So I got to think that's that's important. There's a tight-knit digital signage community that we really want to kind of help out add their consultative services there. Well, you brought up a good point, Frank, which is um, I saw a metric earlier this week, and I believe it was in an Avixa um, article, so I want to give them credit. Uh, but it, it was talking about the combined um, aggregated growth rate, the projections for 2021 to 2025 for our industry, and it's about 7.5%. And I'll be honest, I don't know a whole lot of industries right now that are growing you know, to the tune of 5 to 10%. That's significant growth. You know, Even though it's a projection, that's awesome. That's something we should all be excited about. So. Um, I think people realize the value of visual communications now more than ever. I think people realize um, the value of content. I mean, look how many different professions have been forced to stay in their home, work from home, which means they're getting bombarded with content. Everyone's working on their laptop right now. Folks are getting bombarded with content from online, from mobile applications. Uh, for a lot of folks, I'd venture to say that the TV's running in the background, you know, almost 24-7, right? So folks are, I think, a little bit more attuned to content, they're a little bit more tuned to content delivery. I think uh, folks have done some outstanding job brainstorming um, how they can leverage that in their organization and their business conceptually moving forward, right? So this this growth rate that we're probably looking at as an industry is something that every integrator, whether they're scratching the surface to your point or they've been doing it for years, should be getting excited about and saying, here we go, here's another great channel for us. Yeah, well definitely it's a, a volcano ready to erupt is what we always say around here. and. That kind of goes back to the the culture of our, our company. Even we we ended up doing a pretty big hiring hiring boom during COVID because there was a lot of talent out there. There was a lot of good people that we could really bring in. We had time to train, time to prep, and and we know this is going to come back around. This isn't the end of digital signage. When we saw that slump where we thought the world was ending back in April, um, this is going to come back and it's going to come back strong and. That's why we're we're prepping and preparing for that volcano. It's, it's you know, we don't have a crystal ball. I can't guarantee everyone listening today, but I do know this is going to bounce around, and maybe it comes around election time. I don't know. That's a speculation, but it could be. <laughs> right, we don't know. So it's uh, it's it's an interesting time, no doubt. But I I do know that it's it's going. It can only go up from here, and it's it's going to go up fast in my mind. Frank, you mentioned a second ago um, educational opportunities. I think this is an important bullet point to touch on. Now is a great time um, to be educating, right? And, and that's a that's a general statement, right? It applies to, to clients and customers. It applies to um, teammates within your organization if you're an integrator. Um, it applies to other folks in the channel that you're working with. And you know, use some of this time. My recommendation: use some of this time to. Create some collateral, right? Create some one pagers or two pagers surrounding. Hey, here's what we do awesome as an integrator. Here's what we're really good at. Here's our core focus. Um, create some some remote training sessions. It's really easy now more so than ever to get some of your staff on a webinar, right? To to schedule everyone seeing invites come through left and right. Just send out a half hour invite. Get your staff trained. You know, talk about topics that you might not have talked about in the busy rush of jumping between meetings and conferences rooms in the past. You know. Um, get folks more comfortable with 
some of the core concepts in the digital science space. And, and for a lot of our channel partners where, you know, historically, uh, maybe CMS wasn't at the forefront of the mind, this is a great chance for us to kind of lift the veil and say, hey, it's really not that scary. There's a lot of ways to achieve successful outcomes here. And, and also, by the way, we're here to help. Um, Frank, have you guys taken on some of that kind of consultative role at all, where it's, hey, here's what we do great at Brightside, and, and here's how we help, or how does that work for you? Yeah, so I mean, so this evicts the community in general, right? It's about experiences, it's about creating experiences. So we're also ca uh, cautious about making sure when we do come out with something that's going to be right? Because you guys are going to hop on a webinar for an hour, and you, you got to make it relevant to, for, the, for those folks to, to be on there. Um, so we're trying to, we're coming out with what I call these wow factor presentations, folks, which it keeps it visually stimulating for them. It's got a bunch of videos, um, you know, like pretty cool stuff, really like a production level training. So we're doing a lot more of that. But more importantly, what we've realized, and I haven't, I can't believe we're doing this, uh, we've gone 30 plus minutes. We haven't really used the word pivot too much um, in this uh, bingo game that we're playing, but with the <laughs> We've pivoted because we used to do these certified dealer trainings throughout the country. And I was putting on probably seven or eight minimum a year outside of trade shows. And then we were usually doing conducting some classes at trade shows. Well, obviously that's not happening right now. We're not getting we're not getting to those. So how do I pivot to make sure that my customer base is still very well educated on the what we have to offer and our partner ecosystem? So we're pivoting and creating trainings um, that are online. And again, trying to keep create that wow factor. So um, these, these folks we're talking to right now, are, are the, they're, they're inundated with stuff over the course of a week. The, the content you talked about, Mike, they're constantly put in front of them. So how do you differentiate and make things really interesting to them and keep their attention span? I, I don't know about you guys on the, um, on the battle, but Man, I'll tell you what, I, my ADD kicks in more now than it used to before because I'm, I'm on something for four minutes and I'm like, oh, I lose interest in my own meetings with my team. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a good point. Um, one of the ways we've tried to change our educational process for clients and for the channel in the, the last few months is we've hired and onboarded a, a ton of designers and we've spent some of our downtime um, creating for different industries and different use cases real world examples, oftentimes with real world brands and, and success stories from our client base saying, here's what this can look like, right? And I think that's one of the biggest linchpins that's that's not always you know, in the mix for these types of discussions is what is this gonna look like and how is this going to impact my audience, right? So um, trying to generate some of that and, and really lift the veil and show people, hey, here's what you can do with this, um, this is what I think a lot of us should be doing right now. And that's kind of what I'm, I'm hearing you speak to, Frank. Um, Tony, you guys are a, a very people-centric organization at SNAP. That's one of the reasons I love working with you guys. Um, with us, when we've been doing some onboarding for development staff and for um, you know creative staff, one of the questions that always comes up, and I, and I think this is on the forefront of a lot of integrators' minds too, is should we be going the W-2 route right now? Should we be doing 1099 route with a lot of these folks? I mean, are you guys experienced that at all in the field? We are. We've actually seen an uptick, especially with a lot of integrators um, that, you know, unfortunately with COVID, um, not to go back to that always, but with COVID, a lot of people have been furloughed during this time or laid off. Um, a lot of corporations are shifting some of that thought and some of that, that funding and, and the budget with what they have left um, and what they have in the pipeline has shifted to, a, to more of a, a services platform such as SNAP. Um, the benefit there is, is they only pay when they need it, right? It's not kind of that overhead that's lingering. If there are no jobs on the books, they're still having to pay out of pocket. Um, you know, you never want to see people laid off. It has definitely affected us in that sense where we have seen more requests come in that maybe we wouldn't have done in the past. Uh, where even where we're going in is more of an assisted model where we're working alongside that integrator uh, where we have those local resources over the U.S. So instead of flying four guys out, they fly their, you know, lead installer out and then work with our with our contractors locally. Um, it also keeps costs down with travel, right? I mean, even when you look at uh, if something happens 30, 60 days down the road after that initial install, you know, if we were on site with that team, we now have that expertise. We know the site. We know the customer that we can be dispatched for a quick one-hour service call and get out to site rather than, you know, pay for a flight and hotels. Um, but, yeah, we've definitely seen an uptick in that. And even the education piece, you know, Frank talked a little bit about DSF and, I've had I've had a chance to sit on the DSF Education Committee for a few years, and 
helped a lot with these micro credentials and it's a big push now, especially with Avixia, um, where we can merge that that communication. So going back a little bit to that, where not, even, not only our employees, but people looking to learn more about that, there's a lot of great courses and a lot of different topics specific to, you know, what maybe you want to learn more. So there's a lot of different training courses and things like that. But um, yeah, it's, it's definitely been a shift in those conversations where people have said, we have our own guys, we're good to go. And now they've came back and said that we might need to relook at that model when it comes to the, the services side. So. Yeah, interesting. Uh, I think on the educational topic, the big thing on everyone's mind, at least from, uh, you mentioned VIXA, um, you know, other organizations, is where are we headed for trade shows in 2021? Well, um, I think a lot's still to be determined, right? Um, we have a lot of got to wait and see approach. Um, one thing that we do in Digital Signage Federation is, you know, we're, we're constantly talking to our members and, you know, and that there is that growing need and desire that I think all of us have of getting together and, you know, and, and getting and meeting in person. So just got to make sure that's safe. And once it's safe, I think you're going to find groups that definitely start putting these together again. Um, disappointing. I think I know all of us are disappointed on what happened with DSD. Um, you know, there's there's still that growing need to educate customers on, on digital signage. And I think something is going to happen that, that allows that to happen. If it becomes a bigger part of a VIXA or it's something that some of the folks at the Science Federation take on or, or other organizations, um, there's that growing need. Uh, and I know from a manufacturing standpoint, we want people to, you know, to get engaged with us. We want that mind share. And a lot of times the trade shows do that for us. So, um, you know, in the meantime, we're, we, we got to get creative, right? We, um, as Tony says, we might be doing a lot more drinking from this exact space on these happy hours to find ways to connect. Yeah. Well, I think kind of along those lines too, Frank, it's interesting to see how different um, markets are and different locations are handling this discussion too. You know, we do a lot of business in Latin America, for instance, where um, it's a little bit of a different pace and stage right now than maybe North America is. Um, and the same goes for Europe. I think a lot of Europe, uh, from what I've been reading, is you know, ready to rock and roll and get back on the, the trade show floor in some ways. And so um, it, it's geographically, I think that's uh, some interesting nuances too to, to bring to that discussion. Um, yeah, so that's that's interesting. Um, in terms of some of the, the kind of safety side of our technology, um, a lot of talk around ROI and where that's headed. Well, any thoughts on that, Tony, Frank? What, what do you think the, the objectives are right now in these times for ROI? I think it really matters on, especially at retail, not big box store, but retail is going to be, you know, when those doors open, how do they get them open and how do they get people back in, right? I mean, you look back in the day, uh, they fought so hard back when Amazon first came on the scene and online shopping. They fought really hard to keep people in the store and they made very large investments, you know, across all of their stores, regardless of flagship. Um, I think they kind of have the same uphill battle now. Um, it's going to be a lot of those, the same conversations, but I think the messaging does have to shift to how do we protect the people, the customers, uh, their employees, right? They've, they've got to really think about how do we make sure they know they're protected? How do we get that message out? And then from there, we can now start worrying about the ROI once the doors are open. And the same thing goes for, for arenas and venues when you look at uh, sports stadiums. You know, they're using, utilizing technology now for like the NBA. They have they had LED screens throughout the, the stands to get people there and get that, that excitement back. But um, you know, that, that technology is going to be huge as we, you know, Minneapolis, the Viking Stadium, they went completely paperless. So just that factor, they don't have to hand tickets back and forth and they can use their own phone. No one else has to touch it, right? Regardless if they are worried about people and substances on their phones now. But, you know, how do you use that technology from start to finish to make sure people are safe? I think it's going to be the big message. And then once we get to that point, I think then people are going to start thinking about now, what is our message now that we know people are safe and we have that audience back? Well, plus if the Vikings lose a few more games, you don't have to worry about crowd control. <laughs> you, have, you have Jets in the background, by the way. You have Jets in the background. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, that, that's a, it's a, it's funny because the ROI is pretty much a growing need in every aspect of our business. But the easy ones that I feel like, especially in the, in the COVID safety world is if they need people to man a station, and those people have to make money to be manning a station. Plus, you know, they run the risk of health issues as well. 
um, by manning a station. So if, if the if the technology can be can be implemented and it saves, if they can easily see a path to saving money from that headcount um, of that person measuring that station, that's an easy way to get to ROI. Um, pretty much everything that we do in digital science has some implementation of ROI, right? There's there's ad networks that can justify that. There's a lot of different ways to create that either ROI or at least return on objective. So um, I think folks could find funds for that um, when they're because it's all about safety and if they can get the, uh, their their businesses open, they're they're back to stable. It's easy to update and it's scalable after this crazy world. I think there's easy ways to find some of that ROI, and, and you know, our customer base just has to be creative in, in how they approach that. Totally agree. Um, one of the things on our mind is, you know, at Envix, we do a ton of work with business communications and internal employee communications, you know, projects along those lines. And for a lot of organizations, nonprofit, for profit, uh, this extends to schools, this discussion as well, um, things have been shaken up with people being forced to work from home. And so the ROI now shifts from um, maybe things like customer interaction surveys, right, and, and customer driven metrics to uh, a lot of components surrounding remote communications, making sure that company culture still has a glue to it, if you will, which I think is a, a problem that a lot of organizations are still trying to solve. How do I have a distributed workforce and still have a, a company culture, so to speak, right? So we've kind of shifted our view to um, generating some ROI in a remote capacity, which is a little bit of a, a different angle given that the traditional digital science paradigm is having your audience two feet from the screen or what have you, you know? So, um, and, and that's that's seen some success. We're, we're seeing some positive outcomes with that, but um, it's it's interesting discussion. I think there's a lot of nuances to it. Yeah, we did our, our team, and I really love that culture aspect with the virtual. You know, we have, we have our happy hours with clients, stuff like that, but even internally, our team did a great job. We talked about we had Netflix parties where we were, we'd all log in and watch the same, you know, episode of The Office as a as a company. Or, you know, we did wellness challenges: take a picture, go for a walk, spend an hour outside with your family. Right? Try to try to get that mindset back because I think we're all losing our mind. If if not still, I know Frank has lost his mind about twelve times during this, but. <laughs> You know, I'm just staying focused on for a <laughs> minute. Right. Check my phone record. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, I, I definitely, you know, the culture is big at our company, and we love that culture not only internally, but we love that culture outside of our, within our industry, with our partners, right, our technicians, and that's something I'm looking forward to to get me that in person, shaking a hand. I don't think that replaces it, but you know, we opened our office up in June. We were able to get that opened up safely, and. You know, we do walk around the office with our, you know, I got my mask here sitting here. So we walk around with our masks, uh, one-way walking systems, antibacterial hand wash everywhere. But it was a, it was a challenge to open up, but we, we took a stance. We wanted to do it. And, you know, our employees really embraced it and they wanted to come back too. So it's uh, a lot of different things going on, but that ROI just to see people again and have that normalcy driving to work, right? That was, that was a big thing for us that we really pushed and we, we really enjoyed it so far. So. Uh, guys, I want to build off of that ROI uh, question and, and kind of a lot of what we've been talking about where COVID and, and working from home has really pushed a, a lot of people to embrace technology that they may not have embraced uh, otherwise. Data and analytics, sensors built into display screens and the digital signage, you know, pushing out content uh, based on who's looking, what time of day it is, what's available in the store, so, so on and so forth. Is that something that you see continuing to grow or, or becoming more of a um, uh, more of an opportunity for places even outside of retail or, you know, you talk about the Viking Stadium, they have a lot of QR codes and things that fans can download certain things and they collect data on how many people have downloaded the QR code and that helps tell them, you know, about traffic throughout the stadium. There's a lot of opportunity, but I think up until now it's been a bit of a niche market. Uh, where higher end stores or large stadiums that are really trying to push out an experience. Are there opportunities in corporate education, smaller retail spaces, so on and so forth? And are there opportunities that maybe people aren't even aware of around uh, analytics sensors within digital signage? Yeah, I mean, obviously the short answer there, Jonathan, is yes, absolutely. I think there's all sorts of new and emerging opportunities for um, you know, people tracking applications, if you will. The, the one asterisk I would put on that is a CMS vendor, and we do a ton of work with 
um, processing this type of data and conditional scheduling and, and things along those lines is the fact that historically a lot of this type of work has been based off of uh, facial recognition or has had some component of facial recognition to it. And for obvious reasons, that's a, a real challenge in most environments right now, right? So um, with that asterisk, I would absolutely suggest that, yeah, there, there's a ton of opportunity for um, these types of applications and, and to drive actual business outcomes too versus, um, you know, seeing how people are looking and feeling, so to speak. Frank, you guys do a ton of work with uh, hardware in that capacity, right? Yeah, we do a ton of work. I mean, you, you have to assume right now, um, you know, we're, people are trying to avoid any unnecessary physical contact, right? So there's everywhere that you can you can think of where a sensor could be used. That's probably a pretty cool use case for ROI right now, and it really opens the floodgates to new technologies. Um, especially, I, you know, and, and I only say it now for Touch Interactive. It's going to come back. It's a strong market. We have a lot of partners. Um, in fact, one of the areas we, we are really good at is inter, uh, creating interactive signage. So um, we know that, you know, right now it's a little bit of a bridge the gap. But, I, I mean, I definitely think that, you know, the, the whole, there's going to become more of a Main Street adoption for anything that can trigger content to come to play. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I know a lot of folks that are out there. One of our partners is Nexus, Nexus Fear, and we do a lot of work with them right now. There's a lot of those folks that are out there that are creating new stuff right now. It's pretty cool, and and it's it's going to have longevity after this too, which is which is the key thing that we keep talking about. So, um, pr pretty cool te new technologies. Some of it's new, some of it's not. That's been out there, but it's getting adopted a lot quicker. One of the uh trends, emerging trends I was surprised by, Jonathan, is uh, the resurgence of QR codes and their popularity. And it makes sense, um, you know, obviously from a workflow perspective, right? Everyone's more comfortable having content on their phones and, and to Frank's point, triggering content um, from your own device instead of having to physically touch a screen. Uh, a few months ago, we launched a wayfinding as a service solution. And part of what we baked into that was the ability for folks to still have a 3D interactive experience or, or whatever aspect of wayfinding they want for their organization, but be able to translate that much easier and much more readily available to mobile, you know, experiences. And so that's that resurgence of QR, if you had asked me 12 months ago, if we thought it was going to head that way outside of retail and then the outside of the service, no. Uh, but it's a fairly easy to deploy technology that makes a difference. Tony, I, I think touch screens are kind of on the forefront of everyone's mind right now. What do you guys see in the field in terms of um, demand for it and then also usability? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, this ecosystem is is big on a lot of different types of technology and, and touch was big and it, I think it's still going to continue to be big. Um, I think adapting to it, you know, they now have the touch where it's non-touch touch, right? Where they have the ability to kind of break a seal, right? And you're able to still touch that screen without physical contact. Um, you've also got the access control, which kind of goes alongside of the QR, where you're able to take over that touch, like you said, with your phone and now actually go through that content or wayfinding uh, with the mapping technology that's out there. You can do all that from your phone, but still with the technology that's in place. Uh, but then also the the safety of it, right? There's, there's a lot of companies out there with microbial film or microbial uh, solutions where you can do preventive maintenance. And it's another revenue stream, to be honest with you, where you can go out and re keep redoing these surfaces and cleaning these. I mean, really making sure that that, you know, it goes back to that peace of mind. They want to have that peace of mind. And so, again, people are going to have to touch things. And I know people are a little timid of it, but touching things I don't think will ever go away. And I don't think it will, you know, continue to get more and more uh, more of a use case as we have to learn more about the disease, too. And if there's a vaccine and um, it just it kind of goes back to that. It just it has to be that peace of mind. And what are we doing now? But what will change in the future? But those are questions that I don't think any of us can answer yet. Uh, guys, another, another quick question. You know, there's kind of uh, uh, two camps of thought, and this is post-COVID, you know, recovery. There's one camp that says, for the most part, everything is going to go back to normal, Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, in the office, uh, maybe a little bit of work from home availability. There's another camp largely coming out of the tech sector that says <clears throat> nothing's ever going to be the same. Companies are going to go back to hybrid schedules. Offices are going to be used for collaboration presentation specifically you're only going to go into the office when you have meetings you're going to stay home for individual work where do you come down on that and where does digital signage play into both sides of this 
I'll jump in on that if I may, um, and I'll, I'll kick this off from a perspective of, as I mentioned earlier, at MVIX, we do a ton of work with business communications, and oftentimes it overlaps with business processes, okay? And the short answer from my perspective, Jonathan, is that it's actually not a one-size-fits-all. Um, we get questions all the time about where are we headed in terms of distributed workforce, where our clients headed in terms of um, how many folks are coming back to the office. I think there will always be a value in conferencing solutions. So let's make that clear. I think there's a ton of great stuff you can do in person and remotely with conferencing solutions. But a lot of the clients that we work with who are, who are jumping to organizational conclusions about what should we do and, and is, it a, a, you know, is it a binary situation where everyone's working from home or everyone's in the office, it's really not a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, you've got to figure out what are the most important touch points in your business processes that drive outcomes, where do those need to include physical meetings, where do they not need to include physical meetings. For a lot of organizations, there's tasks um, you know, that require physical inventory counting and shipping and things like that. So there's, there's always going to be some component of working in the office. I don't think we're, we're ever going to be a society that you know, doesn't have folks in the office. I think moving forward, most organizations, including education, um, at, at all levels is saying that there is inherently some value to work from home for some functions and for some roles and some positions. So if you're doing proper introspection, you know, as a, as a client on where your organization should distribute and where you shouldn't, then I think you're, you're going to find that it's, it's going to be a hybrid model in the future. Um, for us as a CMS vendor, what that means is we've got to be prepared to deliver content to both audiences. We've got to be prepared to cater to both audiences. And we've got to do both effectively. And, and I'm really thinking about the users of this technology in that example, especially for enterprise, right? Imagine being a communications manager at a Fortune 500 company right now and what's going through your head about how I keep all my staff on the same page, right? So my job is to provide ways for them to do that easily, but they can also still focus on reaching their customers in an effective manner, which is 90% of their day-to-day -day job anyway. So um, a, a lot of unknowns for sure, but it, it's going to be, a mix and match moving forward, and it, and it won't be the same across all organizations. Yeah, as a manufacturer, I mean, we have the luxury of being a horizontal platform that operates in every single uh, vertical, right? So, and then then you start double clicking in each vertical as sub verticals, and and those sub verticals are different. Like, take an example, like we got hospitality, you got quick service restaurants, and you have you know, five-star restaurants. They're, those needs are going to be different. And then you, you can keep going down into the retail um, example I gave you earlier. Some of the retailers are finding a ton of success through this time. Um, and when then we have, you know, the, the so I think there's going to be different needs for each vertical. And then within those verticals, the sub-verticals have different needs too. Um, so, you know, the, the, the great part where, where we sit at, at Brightside is we are that horizontal platform that, cro that crosses all of them. And then we have great ecosystem partners that do a really, really good work in, in some of their vertical markets. And, and then I, I think there's going to be, you know, customers have choices and they have, they have choices in all of this, um, whether it's COVID or post COVID. They, they have all these choices of, of what they, they need to be doing, but I think what they have, the integrators have to do is make sure that they're providing solutions that could be expanded over time and they're scalable and that give them a, an opportunity to use the, uh, the buzzword bingo of pivot if needed. And I think then they're, they're in great shape if they, if they can find ways to scale their offerings. All right, uh, guys, I, I think that's about our time. Uh, we, we only have until three o'clock and I wanna make sure before we leave uh, for our audience, they all know you know, what you guys can provide for them and how to get in touch uh, with them. So uh, maybe starting uh, with Frank, uh, you know, what can Brightsign do uh, for the integration community and, and how can they find you guys, learn more about you, get in touch with you? Well, the, the beauty of what we've done over the last um, about three years is, is formed a sales team that's out in the regions and very quickly respond to the integration community. So please reach out. Feel free to reach out to me if you don't know your rep and I can connect you um, via LinkedIn or, or Twitter or any any of the, uh, of the resources that you have. Um, and we'll be happy to help. Um, Brightsign.biz is our is our website. You can reach me on Twitter at, at Pisano Frank if if I can help at all. Um, 
we'll, we'll guide you the right direction. And I think the, one of the best things that we do for the integration group is we act as that consultative partner. We'll, we'll put you in touch. We have, we have probably one of the broadest ecosystems um, there is in the industry and, and we'll get you, we'll, you know, we'll get you in touch with the right partners in that ecosystem to, to help solve your needs. Uh, Tony, for those uh, end users that that joined us, uh, tell us a little bit about what Snap Install does and, and how they can find out more about you. Absolutely. Yep. Snap Install, again, we're a nationwide service provider. So we have a network of contractors throughout the entire U.S. as well as parts of Canada. Uh, so really what we can do is we can kind of help push these projects through. And maybe if you do have a lot of projects on the books and need to get these in quick, that's where we can be utilized as a resource to, to help get these designs and these experiences right out real quick we can also be in more than one place at once for you and we we help manage those projects and kind of start to finish a to z mentality so um, you can find us at snap-install.com or uh, twitter we have snap underscore install um, and again feel free to reach out to me on linkedin or reach out to any of us and we can uh, make sure we help support you where we can and mike over at mvix which mvix uh, is the sponsor of today's webinar so thank you for, for putting this together uh, how can uh, our audience learn more about mvix reach out to you and, and get in touch well, Jonathan, MVIX is an affordable content management software solutions provider. So our goal is to drive successful ROI-based projects for our clients uh, in a way that doesn't adversely affect the bottom line. Um, if you want to know more, we partner up with a solutions consultant. So feel free to reach out to myself on LinkedIn, um, our company Twitter, and then MVIXDigitalSignage.com as well. Um, a lot of different resources we can put in your hands and a lot of great educational materials we have, which span a variety of different use cases and verticals. So. I'm um, happy to help with any questions that anyone has after the webinar. All right. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you to MVIX for sponsoring today's webinar. Thank you to the audience for showing up. I just want to let the audience know that today's webinar will be recorded and available on demand uh, at the same link starting 30 minutes after this uh, live session ends. So please do forward it along to colleagues. It was a really informative uh, conversation. I'm sure a lot of people will want to see it that maybe didn't have 2 o'clock uh, free today. Um, I want to remind everyone as well that you will receive a survey uh, following the webinar, please do fill that out. It lets us know, you know, what you want to hear next and, and what you want to learn about. Again, my name is Jonathan Blackwood uh, on behalf of MVIX, BrightSign, and Snap Install for joining us today. Thank you all so much.